All right, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Webb and I am with the News Literacy Project. We are a nonpartisan education nonprofit that is building a national movement to, uh, uh, to create a more news literate America and to help people uh, unite around facts. Um, that sounds good, you say, but what is news literacy? Well, news literacy um, is the ability to determine the credibility uh, uh, and excuse me, I'm nervous, uh, to recognize the credibility of news and information and to recognize the standards of fact-based journalism uh, so that you know what to trust, act, and share on. Um, this is our fourth annual National News Literacy Week, and it's presented by the News Literacy Project and the EW Scripps Company. Uh, newsrooms across the country are supporting this effort, and uh, we deeply appreciate it and thank them, including all of the panelists here with us tonight. Uh, to learn more about News Literacy, please visit newsliteracyweek.org. News so I'm thrilled to have this very talented array of prominent journalists from TV, radio, print, and online with us, and they're all committed to the standards of quality journalism and producing trustworthy, reliable news. Um, so, going down the, the, the line, we have Adam Simpson. He is the president and CEO of the EW Scripps Company, which is one of America's largest TV broadcasters. Adam started his career as an investigative journalist and joined Scripps Corporate Operation in 2003 and worked his, up, uh, worked his way up the ranks. Um, Krissa Thompson is not with us yet, but she is on the way. She had breaking news that she's dealing with. so. We'll bring her out into the discussion once she arrives. She's the managing editor at the Washington Post, where she oversees diversity, inclusion, features, climate, recruiting, and career development. She's the first black woman there to hold the title of managing editor. And she joined the Post in 2001, working as an intern, business reporter, and later becoming an editor in the style section of the paper. Uh, Sarah Gu is the editor of Axios. She joined them in 2019 as executive editor and launched their podcast operations. Uh, <laughs> prior to that, she's held leadership roles at NPR, Pew Research Center, and The Washington Post. And then we have Tony Caven. Uh, he's NPR's managing editor for standards and practices. Uh, before joining NPR, he worked at CBS News for 20 years. He's had senior leadership roles as deputy foreign editor, senior producer at CBS Newspath, an assignment manager at CBS Telenoticias in Miami. And the person who will guide tonight's conversation is the president and CEO of the News Literacy Project, Charles Chuck Salter. Uh, Chuck was the very wise man who offered me the job at NLP, <laughs> and he joined us in 2018 as our first ever chief operating officer and became our second ever CEO last year. He spent two decades working in education as a teacher, school leader, teachers union president, and senior executive with several national education organizations. So without further ado, let's get the panel started. Take it away, Chuck. Great, uh, thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you, panelists, for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to tackle, I think, one of the most important issues uh, when it comes to news literacy, and that is public trust in the media. And so we thank you ahead of time for your candor uh, and, and the fullness of your responses. Um, but before we dive in, I want to take first a poll uh, from the audience. Uh, could you raise your hand if in recent memory you have seen or heard a correction on a news site that you frequent? Keep your hands up if you thought that that correction was prominent, clear, and easy to find. Interesting, okay, <laughs> panelists, with that small sample in mind, uh, let me ask. Uh, one prominent criticism of media is inaccurate reporting, sometimes then labeled fake news. Um, but it's also said that journalism is the first draft of history, and things change as we learn more. Uh, one of our news literacy tips that we often share for identifying whether a source is credible or not is if it has a correction policy. So I'm wondering if you could speak to your organization's correction policy. Um, is it public? Is it easy to find? Um, how do you decide 
if a correction warrants an editor's note? Um, and do you ever explain how an error occurred and perhaps how it won't occur again in the future? It's a free for all. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll start. Um, we do have a, a corrections policy. Um, and furthermore, we also have a uh, uh, code of ethics that we publish on all of our digital platforms meant to be sort of a, a, an, a almost an implicit agreement between what, what we expect of ourselves and our audiences. Um, I would say um, we do a reasonably good job uh, not a perfect job of explaining how the error happened. Um, more often than not, though, what, what I think we we uh, we do is simply correct the correct the error uh, and uh, try to correct the error in its original form. Whether that's you know an error that came out in the form of a push notification, we, we will correct it in the, in the in a follow up push notification or uh, in a, an additional write through explaining what the earlier version of the piece uh, might have said or done. Um, that's, that's part of our policy. Great. Yeah, um, first of all, thanks for this great conversation. It's great to join all of you tonight. Um, yeah, I think we have a corrections policy as well. Um, I think that we, we try to be a, take a, a step further, which is at Axios, we also publish what we call the Axios Bill of Rights for our audience, and that is that we, are, we want to lay out for the audience what we're accountable for to you, what we promise to you in a way. And I think news organizations haven't been very good about this for various reasons, but we felt it was important to go over, not just like that we're transparent about what we get wrong and how we want to correct it, but also things like we want to be clear with you about how we make money. We want to be clear with you about um, you know, if you have a question, who you can reach. We want to be clear with you that only humans will write articles. We, you know, some fundamental basic things to make. Uh, we don't do opinion. We, we, you know, make that like we don't have an opinion section. That's part of you know what what we our core beliefs are. And so I think it would be great if every news organization could put not just you know okay we made an error let's fix it, but took it a step further to, you know. Be clear with the audience, what do I promise to give you when I give you the news about how we do the news, about how, how we operate as a news organization? And I think that does build trust. It, I think it was something that people hadn't seen before. And um, you know they, they, they appreciated it. We heard a lot from our audience about it. So um, I, you know, I, think, I think there are other versions of that that news organizations could, doesn't have to be a, be a bill of rights but I think it's a way to try to open the door a little bit further beyond corrections. I think our policy is not dissimilar. Um, our corrections policy is part of our ethics handbook, which is public at npr.org forward slash ethics. Anyone can go on and read it. We put all of our corrections up where people can see them. We also append them to digital articles. Um, we, it really depends on the correction, how explanatory we get. Today, the one I had to deal with was we got somebody's name wrong, and we just, it was a misspelling, and that's, obviously, there's no reason to get anybody involved in how we screwed that up. We just screwed it up. But when we get something larger wrong, we explain why we did it and how we did it. It, frankly, is tougher in broadcast um, because time is so important, and you have to be very careful. There's also multiple, I suspect Scripps is, does the same thing, the all things considered you hear at five o'clock in Washington can get updated as the news changes for the all things considered you will hear at five o'clock in California. If there are errors in the first one, we will correct them depending on, they have to be pretty egregious for us to explain that we've corrected it. That's um, broadcast I find trickier to do corrections in um, just because time is of the essence. And, the good and the bad thing about the web is there's really no space limitations. So and you're not going to come back the next day and reiterate the error that you made for an entirely new audience in order to, you know, in order to correct it, which is a limitation. Of yeah, and unless it was just so, so egregious yeah. that, you know, yeah. you know, we said so-and-so was president of the United States and he's not, you know, that sort of thing. But 
That hasn't happened yet, thank God. Mm -hmm. And as news organizations are increasingly on multiple platforms, you do have to have a corrections policy that is relevant for that audience, right? So if it's Twitter, it's going to be one thing, you know, you know, here's the tweet we got wrong, I'm going to retweet it and include, you know, what we got wrong and what is correct. For broadcast, you have to think about which part of the audience heard the wrong information and is that useful to correct it or not. And so we do have to think these things through and be clear about it for the medium. We had a debate about that very thing about Twitter yeah. because initially it felt like it was more transparent to append, sort of respond to the, fault, the, the erroneous tweet with a corrected tweet. But some of the younger people who um, are actually make this stuff all work said that they felt that people could just lift the wrong tweet out of that and retweet it and it was actually more dangerous and we'd be better to just send a new tweet that said, here's what was wrong with the previous tweet. And, and yeah. so, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a debate. I'm not saying there's necessarily one answer or another which is better, but I do think that these, as the technology changes, our responses have to change to, to meet the technology. But like you say, one size doesn't fit all. Right. Excellent. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, something specific. In your, in your newsroom. So can you talk about a recent misstep in your newsroom and explain what the organization learned from it um, and how you can avoid repeating it? It doesn't have to be a reporting error, necessarily. Um, it could be any issue. But what did you learn, and how did it possibly improve the journalism of your organization? Mm -hmm. um. Uh, yeah, I, it's hard. There, there, there are errors because we're humans, and I think that what's important is to be trans, to address it quickly, and to uh, be transparent with the audience. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I've dealt with so many errors at many places, but I think the one thing that they have in common that's kind of fundamental is a reporter is often moving too fast, um, and there aren't enough layers built in to check the facts before publication. I mean, fundamentally, that is what happens in most, if not all, cases. Um, in some cases, bad cases, you end up into legal messes as well. But um, in, in that case, it could be training or a lack of training. Um, I can think of an example where um, a reporter just you know, wrote down what she was told and didn't have the proper legal training to understand, like, this is running into a legal area that I need and like a legal review, right? Um, so I think I think the lesson that I've learned is, and in, in for Axios, just speaking as a startup news organization, is you know when you're moving so fast and growing and hiring talent, particularly in this like remote first environment, you have to make sure that there is a baseline of of standards and understanding and training and and structure um, that that backs up to ensure that like that won't happen, to ensure that errors have, um, you know, you decrease the risk when you have multiple layers of eyeballs or ears on the content or the story before it goes out into the world. Um, so I think that's, that's the fundamental thing. It's, it's not uh, rarely, if ever, is it somebody with a, you know, bad intention. I don't think I've ever seen that, but it's just somebody making a mistake and not having like, you know, the two sets of eyes to check it. And I think the thing to recognize is that in journalism, there aren't as many layers, there isn't as much as many resources as there used to be, at least when I started out in journalism. There were multiple editors and you know, before something went into the newspaper, for example. And there's been a lot of layoffs. There's been a lot of reduction in force over the past decades. There's a, we, know, we all know there's a fraction of the number of journalists employed today than there were a couple decades ago. And that's the sad truth about it. It doesn't excuse errors, but it does explain that um, I think that we've lost something. And we're also moving like twice as fast or three times as fast as we used to. So you kind of put those ingredients together, and you see like it's kind of a recipe for risk. Um, and our job, at least my job as the editor-in-chief, is to make sure that I've built a strong enough structure to prevent that from happening and, and, you know, and that reporters have the confidence to know like, and be brave like if they're not 100% or they need another pair of eyes on something that is more sensitive that they, they get that attention. So it's a long answer, but I think the fundamental is, I, for me, is, is structure and, and speed. This will be the second time I say, like she said. <laughs> but it is like she said. Um, especially when you get into technical stuff. We had an issue with wading into a controversy among um, 
disability advocates that we, the reporter didn't really realize was controversial. I think they saw something which they rewrote for the website about a person who I believe had trouble speaking and spoke their graduation speech through a machine. And no sooner did the piece go out than people started writing in saying this was ridiculous, this is all a scam, it doesn't really work. They're, and we thought, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And then we got the other side coming back saying, no, no, this is absolutely true. This has been very helpful for so many people. And it was the complication of a debate, which is a serious debate, which I don't pretend to know the details of, but which we did not recognize sufficiently. And it just showed the need for the sort of general reporters who do a lot of writing to make sure they're talking to our science editors who probably would have killed this problem before it became a problem and would have been fine. When I do new employee orientation, um, I always say, you know, think about a time that you can recall when a news outlet was wrong and everyone raises their hand as you all did before. And I said, think of, do you remember who scooped who on what? Because everyone remembers who was wrong and no one remembers who was first. But we're all trained to be first. And being first is good, don't get me wrong. You want to be first. But if you're first and you're not right, you're not really first. And that's the lesson I, I, I try and give people. And it's just taking the time, as you say, looking for another pair of eyes, finding someone in the newsroom or on Zoom or however it works these days who knows the subject area well enough that they can say to you, you're making a big mistake there that you didn't realize. Because that's what happens a lot. We had a recent issue in one of our newsrooms in which one of our reporters interviewed uh, an academic who was essentially providing some, uh, who, who was essentially providing some, some feedback or, or maybe even criticism uh, around a, uh, I believe a judicial nominee. And it turns out that, you know, obviously the subject of the story was, took, took, took offense and was upset about, uh, about the, the reporting. Um, everything that the academic shared on camera was entirely factually accurate. Um, what we probably didn't know in our haste was that the academic had clearly demonstrated on social media a pretty severe political bias in the opposite direction. And so, you know, two things can be true at the same time. What she had described was entirely factually correct, and what we didn't know but could have put in the piece about her previous positions would have made the piece more fulsome, would have made it a wholer piece. Um, and, and perhaps we might not have used her uh, in, in the story, or perhaps we might have, but that disclosure would have helped provide some perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think you know, the lesson there, in addition to you know, slow down, which you heard just now, um, is one of leaning in on transparency and recognizing that it's oftentimes, I think, more important to peel back the curtain and provide for the audience, in our case, or the readers, um, how you come about your decision and, and, and essentially um, more about the individual or more about the sources than, um, than, than we historically, I think, have done, especially when you think about investigative journalism that, that you know, can often rely on, you know, labor or management, everybody's got an angle. And I think providing that angle with greater transparency actually builds greater trust with our audience. So at this time, uh, I'm to tell the audience that you can actually submit questions for the panel. Uh, after we have about an hour long discussion, we will take about 15 more minutes to take questions from all of you. And the way that you can do that is by emailing uh, your question to media at newslit.org. So media at newslit.org. All right. Um, so let's talk about now a specific news story. Um, oh, wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry for <being> late. <clears throat> Excellent. 
Okay. I came uh, in, in time for the hard question. Yeah, right here. This is there. We're going to get real. Okay, here. So let's let's talk about the story that um, there have been some criticism from people on the right that newsrooms didn't properly cover Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, did your organizations report on this? If so, when did you decide to do so? And has this become a bigger issue than was originally anticipated whenever those decisions were made? You want to take that one, Chris? Sure. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> Thank Welcome. you. Chris Thompson with the Washington Post. Sorry to be late. We did cover uh, Hunter Biden's laptop. I'm trying to place the exact time. I mean, we know that these stories are politicized. That happens. Um, it's incumbent upon us to report the facts as they happen with as much transparency as possible. Um, until recently, we had a very strong media columnist in Margaret Sullivan, who I think rightly held the Post and other news organizations into account for just the kinds of things that I think we're getting at here, right? The question of the context around the story. Um, we're, we're in one of these situations now, right, where we have two, a, a sitting president and a former president who both had classified papers that were found, and yet there are very different circumstances around those, but two important stories for us to cover. And I think you know, part of Margaret's critique is even if we're writing those stories with the level of context that tells you how the Biden administration has behaved differently than former President Trump and his administration did, the fact that the headlines are there can cause people to come away with you know, a certain degree of skepticism as to whether um, we are treating this in a sort of both sides um, situation. I think you know, if people read the, the work, it is more nuanced than that. And, and I feel for our newsroom in particular, um, that, that is our job, uh, to provide the context, to tell these stories. And then we hope that as media literacy in the country grows, that people are able to uh, discern the difference. Mm -hmm. We covered it as well, although I think what this particular story, and I don't know if everybody remembers all the details of it, because it was a while ago, um, but I think what it represents is this, this is a story um, that came, was an October surprise. It was a month before the presidential election. Um, and I think it represents like, um, you know, a, a new take on an old uh, formula, which is, you know, there's going to be efforts from uh, the political parties, and I'm not saying one versus the other, um, you know, to, to influence the campaign, of course, that's been going on for, for, for a very long time. What's complicated about this case is, is you know, it involved, um, you know, allegations of, you know, um, a laptop, technology, and you know, parsing through data and emails, and and that that is like a whole other level that like not all news organizations can do or can verify independently, um, can authenticate, um, you know, that it's real, can um, it can feel confident in the you know chain of custody, um, and so I think that what we're increasingly seeing and what's increasingly difficult for journalists is as technology evolves and um, you know that can include deep fakes or you know text or photos like it's just more confusing for the audience and it's more it requires more sophisticated technology um, and um, and uh, you know ability to really find the truth to authenticate for ourselves independently not take someone's word for it we never would do that. Um, but to independently verify something is what someone claims it to be um, and understand the motives behind that, of course. And so I think this is just something that is going to become more commonplace, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be someone who's going to, a news outlet that will take it and will rush it through and, you know, come up with the headline. And, and we, 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 we covered it just like a lot of other news organizations. But just personally, we didn't have the sophistication that say like the Post or the Times has, you know, with developers and people, third parties that they can send something out to, to, to really parse through that. So that's a very complicated answer, but like the larger point I think is, is just that 
um, you know, journalism, journalists have to keep up. And um, I think be even more cautious um, because they have to understand what they have or what they're being told they have. They have to check it. I, I would just say, you know, precisely the same answer. I mean, we certainly covered the story and the story of the story. I, I would say we were not equipped to be able to do an independent analysis uh, and, and essentially provide enough details, and so we tended not to wade in. Right. Right, because you don't, if there's a story out there that you can't independently verify, then what is your role then in repeating that Propagating story? It. Right, right, right. So I think that a lot of news organizations kind of reported around the edges because there were other implications for when something is out there. So in this case, it was, you know, Twitter, as you recall, like, changed its mind and you know blocked you know links to so people could read the story of the news um, about the Hunter Biden laptop for a time and they changed their mind and so it became a social media story and it became it just became it kind of had other stories within, <laughs> within the original story um, I don't know if that made the, the story more complicated for readers but probably um, but anyway I think like that is that is a responsibility that we can cover like this is a, a, a new way that the social media uh, companies need to consider their role in it, not just traditional media. We, um, well, I've, I've got the, the strangest answer of all because I will say that I was not at NPR when this happened. I have, <laughs> however, <laughs> have plenty of evidence in my inbox that we did not cover the story at the time, much to the chagrin of some of uh, the people who are writing in. Um, the feeling, as I understand it, and I, I hate sort of doing this all third hand, but as I understand it, the feeling was it was one source, which was the New York Post, which was a source that was not particularly reliable. What I don't know and can't speak to intelligently is whether or not, as this became part of the debate, we then covered that. But we did not cover the initial story. Um, at my previous employer, we sort of covered it around the edges the way, the way other people mm -hmm. did. Um, but I think this, you know, when you mentioned deep fakes, we had an interesting thing just this morning where we were interviewing somebody in El Salvador, the Minister of Justice, and asked about a senior official who was photographed with a gang leader, and he said, oh, that was a deep fake, it never happened. And so not only do you have the threat of people putting out deep fakes and getting you to report on them, but this became the excuse by this guy to deny a meeting which there was photographic evidence of had ever taken place, to just, because now that everyone knows this technology's out there, it's sort of a double-edged sword. So actually, this leads uh, perfectly to the next question. Um, and some of you have already touched a little bit on this, but we go back to the basic idea of trust in media. And you know, trust in a free press is vital to democracy. And if people don't know where they can get the facts and the truth, they can't possibly make good decisions or participate in the civic dialogue. So what do you all do uh, in your organizations um, to help audiences understand how journalism is made. I think another way to put this is what kind of transparency do you offer into the process of how you bring people the news? Um, I mean, this week, News Literacy Week, is but one week out of the year uh, during which we, we do try to pull the curtain back on more of the process around the editorial decision making. Um, and it starts with a dialogue, I would say, with our, with our audience. Uh, I can come up with a number of different examples where uh, our, our news leadership has literally uh, explained both online and, and in broadcast to the audience why we made a certain decision. Uh, going back to what now feels very basic, for example, uh, I remember our very first decision to refer to a trans teenage girl as a girl, despite the fact that there were officials in the community that were calling her a boy. And we decided to, to refer to her in the way she wanted to be referred to. And we felt the need for the first time, this was years ago, to come out and explain why we were doing that. Uh, when we made a decision to end the use of what I, what I think is the gratuitous use of mugshots, um, we came out and, and were clear with our audience 
why we were going to be differentiating our coverage again and ending the use of mugshots, except in cases when the public was at risk and, and, and they were you know, looking for somebody based on a, a, a relatively um, sound judgment that this, this was the person. Um, and it was that dialogue, I think, that we have with our audience between news leadership and our uh, audience that sets the tone then for our expectations for how we think our reporters should also dialogue with the audience. So I think process is an important part of storytelling. I think traditionally broadcast and print has shied away from process. We sort of, we sort of tell the story as we see it, we deliver it as a nice, neat package, and what we do behind the curtain is none of your business. That's got to change. You know, if we're all about transparency, we're certainly pushing for transparency with respect to, you know, corporations and, and, and the government. We have to be willing to provide that same level of transparency with our audiences in how we make our decisions. And so we've talked a lot with our, uh, our reporting staffs about ensuring that you're explaining through your storytelling why you went here, why you went there, how you arrived at this conclusion. And I think that helps build trust. So this week, actually, um, on Scripps TV stations and on Scripps News, we'll be dedicating a tremendous amount of time to explaining uh, the story behind the story. Because we use News Literacy Week as a vehicle to really take time away from you know, even other news to, to try and, and, and develop that, um, that authenticity, that rapport, that too often, I think, gets uh, that gets sort of papered over. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I think we're very proud of the rigor of our journalistic process. Um, and we also know that we have to work harder to make it visible to our readers and not assume that people understand. For example, we had a reporter who knocked on someone's door to try to get comment and then you know, was accused of invading privacy, that sort of thing. Things that we take as fundamental to the journalistic process uh, and fairness in reporting can very easily be misunderstood. I mean, we've done things like our video team did a series interviewing uh, people on staff about how they do their work and that exists on our site. Some of um, the most popular story forms we do are when we take source material and documents and annotate them, um, making the source material available to uh, readers is something that they really enjoy. Um, we've had a lot of success with our work in visual forensics, which again is taking source material, annotating it in a way, putting it, um, you know, along with graphics and journalistic form. We've had broader conversations about more that we can do, right? Um, whether it is, you know, using additional annotations in stories to explain the process as people are going through, um, you know, creating perhaps a blurb uh, at the top of the story or below that explains that the person actually went there. I mean, people, some people don't know what a dateline is, for example, and we, again, could do more to take what for us are just the building blocks of the work and you know, do more to explain them. We have some public facing policies that explain journalistic ethics and those sorts of things. We just hired a couple of standards editors that are going through a process of um, updating those and making sure that they're as clear as possible. And I think we could do more there as well to share with readers, again, the rigor of journalism and the fact-based information that we're bringing to them. Yeah, I think Krista just mentioned some really great examples that I think um, show how journalism is evolving and becoming a little bit more open to how we do need to engage with the audience and, and earn that trust by sharing a little bit about how we do the story. But you know, where that reluctance has come from is that journals are reluctant to be the story. We are not the story and we don't want to be the story. We want to tell you the story and not get in the way of that. Um, and so I think there is culturally a little bit of 
um, um, concern about like, when is that appropriate? And I think that's been our approach as well. I do think one thing to add is I do think that podcasting has been a great entry point for journalists to kind of take you there, but also show you how I'm doing the story. And I think that's been, you know, a, a very eye-opening for the audience to say, wow, I had no idea how journalism worked, and I don't know if that started with Serial or, or others, but I think it's an awesome way to um, bring the reader along the, the journalism journey, if you will. But it's also, um, this approach is not appropriate for every story, right? If, if there's breaking news, you don't need to know. Um, we need to tell you if they've got something wrong, but like we don't want to be in the way. And so I think that a lot of <laughs> newsroom leaders are trying to find what's the right balance and have the conversation about when should this be a great opportunity, a kind of story to kind of bring you in. And the cool thing is that with so many different opportunities with digital, with photos, with podcasting, with video, you do have a lot more creative um, creativity and creative options at your, you know, on your menu to kind of play with. And so when you're designing that story from the beginning, from the time it's assigned, that you can think those things through and think what is the, what is the best experience for the audience to tell the story and how much of that needs to, does a reporter need to be in that? And now it's part of the conversation, whereas I think before the default was it's not. You know, we've used our Instagram for things like that, too. Like, if people have gone off on a big project, you can sort of come along with us on the Instagram, and we'll, and we'll take you there. But we also have a, uh, a public editor, which a lot of people don't have anymore. And um, she's completely independent of the newsroom. And if she feels that something is not the way it should be, or if she gets letters from people who feel that way, um, she will then sort of report it out by talking often to me, but often to the people involved directly. <laughs> about what the criticism was and why was it, and she then writes a column about how she found what we did and how we did not whether or not she thinks it was the right thing to do. And we've had some, some back and forth, shall we say, she and I, on, uh, on some of these issues, but I think it's good to have people who hold our feet to the fire. Um, we also try, as, as you all say, as, as to be as explanatory as possible when we're doing stuff. Here's what we're doing and why we're doing it, and I think people do appreciate that. So I just want to switch gears a bit and ask each of you a specific question about your organization. So we'll do a lightning round here before we, we move on. So Adam, we'll just, we'll just go in order, Adam. So according to a Gallup Knight Foundation poll, <clears throat> more Americans trust their local news over national news. And since Scripps stations provide both local and national coverage, what do you make of this disconnect? And uh, how much support does Script scripts give local stations on finding that balance between national and local? Um, I think it comes down to the co-opting of the word news by the cable outlets. And the fact that, you know, when the cable outlets began early in my career, they were, in fact, news operations uh, with bureaus all over the world staffed by journalists and 24 hours of packages and reporting. And as time has gone on, they have migrated to what feels more like talk radio on television and less like, um, less like news reporting. Not always, but for long chunks of the day. And, um, and so that has led to a higher level of distrust at least on the broadcast side, of national news outlets versus our local news outlets, which have never gone there. Uh, we have uh, 61 television stations. Each uh, operates with the same set of values, the same uh, guidelines around independence, uh, the same code of ethics that I described earlier, and yet, not every local broadcast company is the same either. Some do not um, approach their responsibility or their mission in the same way. And so we also have to contend with the fact that maybe we are the best looking house on a sometimes <laughs> maligned block. <laughs> so from a local perspective, um, you know, we focus on, on doing um, doing what we do, 
and ensuring that we are of the community that we're serving, that we are there to make people's lives better, that we are there to hold the powerful in those local communities accountable and, uh, and, and you know, report the news, and you know, we, we, we leave it at that. Um, with our national news outlet, Scripps News, which is used both on a network in and of itself as well as in our local stations, we, we abide by those same rules. So you can tune into Scripps News on connected television or on, uh, on broadcast, and you're not going to see uh, punditry. You're not going to see people arguing with each other for hours on end. You're going to see reporting. And it's the same expectations around independence. That's what, is, um, that's what makes our company different. Um, and, and frankly, you know, I, I don't know that those numbers you cited, I'm not sure they will change as long as there's not consistency in our industry, whether it's you know, broadcast television, print, uh, or, uh, or digital, or, or radio. Uh, we have to differentiate ourselves away from those folks that don't necessarily hold their work to the same standards. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you don't get to control anything other than your own work product. Of course. Thank you. So, Krista, um, speaking of reporters becoming the story or not wanting to become the story, recently, um, Post reporters' use of social media has been an issue uh, at the paper. And I'm curious, where has the Post landed on the line between reporters promoting their stories on social media versus criticizing other reporting or even other reporters' posts? Yeah, um, I think obviously the development of social media over the last decade plus has been something that newsroom leaders have had to grapple with. Um, and we, I mentioned we have standards editors now, have recently updated our social media policy to try to keep up with some of those changing standards. Um, it is very much like what Sarah was saying earlier, the question of being the story versus reporting the story. And I think we have some fundamental guidelines in that we don't want anyone's social media post to impugn both the reputation of the post, but mostly our ability to execute on the mission, which is to provide fact-based journalism. And so we do ask our reporters to stay within certain guidelines uh, so that uh, understanding that though they are on their own um, social media platforms previously with Twitter and on others, that blue check signified in large part that they were connected to the post as an institution. Um, and so we ask people not to attack um, their colleagues um, to be thoughtful about any criticism of peers, uh, to, to behave uh, professionally on those platforms, recognizing that what they do will redound back to them as journalists and representatives of our news organization. Um, at the same time, I think newsroom leadership has had to evolve to recognize that you know, these are places where people are expressing their personalities and identity and um, having a more free-flowing conversation than you normally would ha have. Um, obviously, there are places where the editor is not editing the social media posts, post, so some of the rigor um, that we're so proud of can be lost in some of those conversations, but we do ask people to hold themselves to a really high standard um, and most do that very well day in and day out, both, I think, helping to provide some education about how journalists do their work, right, how they're gathering material. Uh, we've had journalists who have used their social platforms as tools for reporting, right, to source information, and that has all been to the good. And so I think we're trying as the platforms evolve and as journalists' use of them evolve to keep up with those changes while at the same time, you know, holding fast to the things that are core, which is, oh, you know, we're not the story, we tell the stories. Um, we, you know, for those who are not columnists or critics who are sharing their opinion as a part of their work to refrain 
from doing that about you know areas that we cover or that they would potentially cover. Um, and so all of that is a part, I think, of an ongoing dialogue. Um, but we found that it is very important for the news organization to be clear about where those standards are, um, to be in dialogue with the newsroom about the changes that are happening, and also to be very thoughtful about the fact that um, journalists, and particularly journalists of certain backgrounds, can come under attack on those platforms just for doing their work, for practicing journalism, and to be empathetic about that and to speak up for um, our staffers and peers in the industry when that does happen and use those as moments to explain to the public writ large uh, about you know, the work of journalism and the questions we're asking and the importance of asking difficult questions and holding people to account. Thank you. Um, so Sarah. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of this question when we started talking about Hunter Biden's laptop, which when anybody asked me about that story, I think I couldn't even explain it to people. I think it's a little bit <laughs> right. convoluted and, and complicated for sure. So I wanted to talk about um, Axios's smart brevity branding. So um, talk about the, the tension between brevity, uh, where many people will read the articles to be at least partially informed, uh, versus in-depth comprehensive reporting. Um, that leaves readers more thoroughly informed. Do you think uh, some issues are too complex to cover in 300 words or smart brevity? Um, no, I appreciate the question. Um, so it might be helpful to explain smart brevity a little bit for people who aren't familiar with it. But it's, it's, a, it's a writing style, a format, if you will, that we have at Axios that is meant to be um, worthy of your time, to make sure that it's very audience first. And a lot of newsrooms say that. But when you think about how people really read, majority of the time we are reading on a very small device, and we do not have a lot of time. It is in between other tasks that we are doing. And so what Axios set out to do is to create a format for news that meets the reality of that common experience. And the way I describe it to, um, to, to folks and to journalists uh, and non-journalists is, you know, it's really a format, you know, designed for that platform, right? And when I started, and Chris and I used to work together at the Post a long time ago as cub reporters, and our goal was to write a great story for the newspaper every day. And we had to write in a really weird style, if you think about it, that where we didn't write our own headline, but we wrote the story, and it had to fit in a column, and it had to like you know make some kind of sense by the end of the page, and then flip to another page. It was clunky, and it and it was designed to fit the real estate of how people read. And I I think Axios's smart brevity is no different. But for the phone, we know how people scan with their eyes, and so we have bold text, we have bullet points. It's so controversial. Um, <laughs> but what the amazing, we tell you how long it's going to take you at the top of every article. It's going to take you four minutes or three minutes or five minutes. And what we hear is people say, thank you. Thank you so much. And, 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 and I think that writing short, if anybody read Strunk and White back in college or <laughs> high school knows, is that smart, you know, it's smart, it's harder. You have to be more disciplined to write short, but it doesn't mean that it's worse. It doesn't mean that it is lacking information. You just have to be much more judicious about what kind of information you put in every inch of that screen. And so that's what we're trying to do is to you know, distill those articles. It's actually very clarifying for reporters too, because every reporter knows that um, they have to have a nut graph. They have to say to the reader, why does the story matter? And we literally, in every article, say why it matters. And our um, what we call is the atomic unit. On the screen of a phone, we will show you a headline, an image, and we have to get to why it matters. We call it the atomic unit. If we haven't done that for you in one flick, we failed at the story. Doesn't mean the story isn't great. It just means that it hasn't delivered on smart brevity. So, um, so it's a challenge for some reporters, honestly, to adapt to it, but they find it very helpful. And, and just make no mistake, 
all the same reporting and time and energy into doing that story that might, that same article that might appear, you know, as a two minute piece on NPR or, you know, a front page story um, in the post is, is distilled into smart brevity. There's a longer version you can read online, but for your phone, for your, new, for your email, at least, we find that our readers really appreciate it. So I actually see that a lot of news organizations are adapting this model. I think they should. Um, they're copying our style or coming up with a version of their own. And I think it's really the future of reading, at least you know, on a screen that's five inches. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tony, before we get to you, just another plug um, to submit your questions to media at newslit.org, which we will get to in just a few minutes. Um, but Tony, you recently wrote about why NPR was refraining from calling the Buffalo supermarket shooters writing a manifesto. Uh, can you talk about your thinking with that? Um, did that frame deprive NPR listeners from learning more about, say, the Great Replacement Theory or what else fuels uh, white supremacy? Uh, I don't believe it did. I think the, the point of saying, let's not call this a manifesto, is because I think a manifesto implies a certain amount of political sophistication. Um, it implies a certain amount of thought. Um, it's, you know, you. A manifesto is sort of weighty, it's a tome. And this, to me, was, we know these theories are out there, we have an obligation to report on them, and we did. I think it's, you know, there are people who say, you know, they don't want to report anything about the shooter, and this has been a debate in a lot of newsrooms of how much should you say, and it's unfortunately a debate we just had again this weekend, and we will no doubt have again very shortly. But I do think, personally, it's important to say who the shooter was, and if they're motivated by some sort of ideology or racism, you need to explain what that is. The Great Replacement Theory has slowly snuck its way into more and more of our mainstream media, and people need to be able to recognize it. That's our job, to tell them what this is. But at the same time, I don't think we should necessarily treat this as if it's some weighty philosophy like democracy or like communism or socialism even, but it's, it's, it's it's sort of a made up rationale for hatred. And I think we sort of need to portray it that way. And so that's why um, I put that guidance out. And I did get some pushback from some people. So I, perhaps I should have written it for five inches or more clearly or whatever. But I did get some pushback from people who felt precisely that, that I was trying to downplay the motivation. And then what I wasn't saying is let's not talk about motives, let's not talk about what happened here, but let's not use language that it doesn't deserve to be, to, to be called. Let, let's not dress it up. Let's not put lipstick on a pig, basically. Wonderful. So um, I think what we'll do right now is um, looking at the clock at 725, uh, we'll go into some of the questions that we have from the audience, which are actually coming to me through my phone. So I'm not <laughs> checking out here. I'm, I'm, I'm just actually reading the questions. Um, so this is from Douglas in Chicago. We have a pretty healthy virtual audience tonight. And he asks, uh, how do you keep sources with, as you say, an angle from completely taking over a story with their possible agenda? I, I mean, I think that's incumbent upon us as journalists. I mean, that's what, that's what we exist to do. And that's the difference, frankly, between uh, you know, using Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or Instagram as your news source and using a you know, legitimate, branded uh, journalism organization that has a masthead that you, you, know, you, you trust and that you've, uh, you've vetted. Our job is to try and provide that context, as I said before, where I felt like we could have done better is, having, uh, is in providing that context. Um, you know, it, it, it's tough. Like I said, you know, two things can be true at the same time. Somebody can have an angle, and they can be entirely factually correct. And so I, I think what we have to do, I mean, our, our, our focus, as our, as our motto says, is, is to give light so that the people will find their own way. I believe strongly that adding that transparency, providing that context, doesn't, doesn't dilute the story but actually provides a greater level of assurance to the audience that we're sharing with you everything we know about uh, the source so that you can decide if the person's predisposition 
perhaps um, perhaps uh, uh, weakens the argument. Um, I think to do anything other than that is 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 to continue to reinforce the problem people have with the media, which is we get to decide what you know. And when we decide what you know and don't, and don't hold ourselves to the same level of accountability around transparency that we speak all the time about with respect to the government or, or, or corporate America, that's, that's where, um, that's where we, 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 we have failed in the past and we need to evolve. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think we we vet the source and we share both the information they provided and what the angle is so that the reader then can decide. The, the question is also you know, causing me to think about this renaissance that we had uh, you know, in the last five, maybe seven years of fact checking, right? Every, almost every news organization uh, launched a sort of fact checker vehicle, which many did just that, which is to say, here's the claim, here's the information, here are you know the documents or the facts that surround it. You know, is this claim mostly true, <laughs> not true at all? Where does it sit, you know, on that spectrum? And you decide what you think about it, uh, and, and so. Um, particularly we, as we sit here in Washington, we know that so many sources do in fact have an angle. That is not uncommon in any way. It is when we you know, treat that information and that source journalistically and talk to people who perhaps have another angle about the same um, you know, situation or facts and tell a full story that provide people with the context that they need to understand the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a simple way, um, a simple way to um, to get at that is, I think, uh, uh, you know, to make sure that every reporter, every person you talk to, you have to answer the question: Why is this person giving me this information? You have to know the answer to that question, and it's as simple as that. Um, and that forces the reporter, or the editor, to think through: Like, is this, you know, is this a story? Can I trust it? What uh, what's missing? What perspective is missing? Um, you know, knowing that motivation doesn't mean that you necessarily discount the story, but you or, or the information. But it's helpful to understand why they're talking to you. Why are they talking to just? Are they talking to just you? Um, what is their goal ultimately? And especially in Washington, of course, that's especially very important. Yeah, I think that there's there's a need for source literacy yeah. among some reporters. Um, and I, I would venture to say none that work for these organizations, but there are a lot of places that are turning things out quickly and they say, we need an expert on taxes, or we need an expert on immigration. And I have seen this happen where they'll call somebody up and not realize that this is an organization with an agenda. Those organizations figured out very quickly that there is a demand for fast sound bites mm -hmm. to fill all news cable or to fill a lot of uh, quick television spots or whatever. and. It seems like oftentimes people aren't being very source literate. The other and obvious answer is you have to have more than one source. I mean, that's <laughs> you know right. the source won't take over the story if there's more than one source, and that, and that's what it is, combined with everything that everyone else said. That you know, for for as much as it's interesting, for as much as there are going to be flaws in our system, we are there to some extent to make sure we try and um, provide that context. What we have seen with social media is sources, whether they're press secretaries, police departments, local police departments, politicians, going directly to the consumer. And what, what I think we all as a society need to be clear on with, with respect to news literacy is, do, does our audience understand, do our, from our children to the adults, do they understand that when uh, they are reading something on Twitter that comes directly from the police department, it is coming directly from a source with no follow-up question, right? It is coming um, right from the start from an angle. And, and what I worry about is less, you know, when we're not perfect, although that's really important for trust, what I worry about is the preponderance of information that's now going directly to the consumer um, and, and comes with no perspective, no context. You know, I, I think the Obama administration really uh, you know, 
uh, did a terrific job of, of beginning a direct-to-consumer relationship, and everybody has learned tremendously that they, they can go around journalism. And, and you know, I want to make sure that my children understand what happens when you're reading something directly from somebody who has an angle. Because you know, then there's nobody to do that fact-checking. There's nobody to do the sort of contextual, rel you know, providing the contextual relevance that we, we attempt to do. Just today, the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, announced that he was going to start a newsletter because he doesn't like the press coverage because he says it's unfair. And so he's going to go straight to the people of New York and let's get those terrible reporters out of the way because they're giving you a biased version of what I'm doing and you're not hearing about all my wonderful accomplishments. So that's exactly what you're saying is happening. Right. Interesting. So um, I want to switch gears just one more time, and I, I don't want the evening to end without us uh, covering this. Um, I think one of the foundation blocks of trust um, in media or anything would be representation. Um, and so in 2022, there's a survey of journalists by the Pew Research Center uh, that found that 52 percent uh, said that their newsrooms do not have enough racial and ethnic diversity. Um, is this an issue that your organization is working on? And what are you doing specifically to make your newsrooms and their coverage more inclusive and diverse? Um, I can start. Um, yeah, I, I, I share that sentiment. I think that it's something the news business has always struggled with. Um, it, it was very apparent to me when I started my career. Um, and it's very important to me as a news leader to change that. Um, and it's incumbent upon me. Um, I think that, you know, um, there are a lot of programs uh, for journalists um, at the entry level um, to ensure that there's diverse, the workforce represents the communities that we're covering. Um, in our case at Axios, I actually, um, as I became a news leader at different organizations, I saw the same problem and I realized I could do something about it. The problem was that it wasn't, it was kind of easy to find a diverse candidate pool at the entry level because that's kind of what like college demographics looks like today. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was more specialized roles that were higher paying, that were often the candidate pool was not diverse at all, um, and it was very frustrating. And, and, and time after time, I found myself, whether it was a White House correspondent role or a science reporter or a markets reporter, in my case at Axios, hiring you know, very specific roles, like a crypto reporter. <laughs> it's hard to find, like, what does that pool look like? And if it is not diverse, um, I can sit and complain about it, but that's not actually solving the problem. So uh, last year, we uh, launched an effort, a fellowship program, or aimed at not entry level, but mid-career journalists who want to be a beat reporter in a specialized area who came from an underrepresented background to um, embed a year with us and train on our teams and report alongside our other beat reporters and learn the beat. And we have four uh, journalists, four reporters um, who are learning healthcare, who are um, you know, on the world, um, new, world news team, um, and, and several other areas of racial diversity and race and justice team. Um, and it's, it's been great. And I, I hope that they, the whole goal is that they come out of it at the end and they are skilled and marketable um, and will either work for me or, or you or Krista <laughs> or anybody on the stage. And I think that um, that is small, but I think one measurable thing I felt like I could do because I don't think, um, I think that it's, it's, it is about representation. It's not just who's working, but who are we helping to kind of get to that next level that we wanted to address. That's great. That sounds like a great program and have to get the names <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, you know, totally agree with Sarah. I remember starting my career in the industry, setting these big goals that Newsrooms would look like America at that time. Was it by 2020? I don't know. We yeah. keep like changing, changing the bar. It keeps moving, and we're we're not getting there. I think um, fundamentally, what we know and what constant conversations with our readers and surveys, <laughs> as we think about cultivating our relationship with the next generation of readers, is this is what they're demanding. Um, they are looking uh, at our journalists. Um, they're reading our reports. 
They're interested in diversity in sourcing. Who are you talking to for these stories? We're talking to the same people over and over again. I know NPR has a program where they are, are able to look at, you know, the, the diversity in the sources. What are the voices that you're putting on the air? That's very important. Um, similarly, who, you know, who are we writing about? Who's telling these stories? Um, and who are we talking to? Uh, and so in order to make the sort of progress that we need to in bringing some of the folks who are following us on our Instagram account that has six, six million followers over to the post to be subscribers, they want to see people who look like them, who are engaged in the work of reporting. Um, and Sarah is absolutely right. I mean, we still have a fabulous internship program and we are able to hire, you know, our audience staff is very diverse, folks who are interested in the audience cultivation roles. And part of the work that we've done in the last few years is really making sure that in the same way a reporter could transverse a newsroom like The Post, which has, you know, 1,100 staffers and be a reporter over here and do this thing and have a career that's varied and interesting within one news organization, are we providing the same kinds of trajectory for folks who maybe start off with an interest in audience and then want to go dabble in reporting or become assignment editors and bring a different skill set and perspective to those roles? So we're working on being, you know, very expansive in the ability to, you know, provide that training and also just a respect for the different disciplines that now exist within journalism that didn't. Um, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago. I think all of that is really important. But we, you know, as the country continues to grow more diverse, we'll just, that trust that we're talking about here will continue to dissipate if we're not able to make more progress in this space. Um, like my colleagues here said, I mean, very similarly, I, I think that we see uh, our efforts around equity, diversity, and inclusion to be not just the right thing to do, but as a competitive advantage. Uh, I think historically, uh, broadcast television has done pretty well with what you see on television and not so well with what you don't, especially in the news leadership um, side of things. At our company, you know, from the boardroom to the newsroom, we really expect to represent the communities we serve. Uh, and I think that for us, that's meant uh, a lot of intentional hiring to over-index, even in, in periods right now um, when it's, it's difficult to attract and retain um, people into our business. We want to over-index in hiring um, people of color, women, and not just into the entry-level roles, but create a path for them to develop as a, as a professional and, and, uh, and to continue to move into senior management. And uh, it's just about intentionality. And, and again, it's, you know, it's not just because it's the right thing. Frankly, I, I, I think it's um, what's necessary if you want to be in business and continue to thrive. I, I also think that it makes for a better newsroom. I mean, it doesn't just make people feel good about themselves. But the newsroom, if a newsroom doesn't reflect the community it's attempting to cover, it's not going to be able to cover that community. You know, you're like the foreign correspondent who's somewhere where they don't speak the language and they don't, you know, exaggerating, of course, but it's in our interest as a news organization to make sure that we do this. And I think at NPR, it's, 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 they, they refer to diversity as our North Star. Um, we've got this tracking system to know who we're talking to and, and so we can be aware and you get rid of some of your implicit bias when you start looking at the numbers and you say, well, what do you know? How did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's got to be sort of in everything, but I think it also has to be understood. It makes you more competitive and it makes you better and, 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 and there's really no downside to it in that sense. Great. So we have about, uh, we're going to go over just a few minutes. So we have about <laughs> nine minutes. Um, and I'd love to get through two more questions. The first comes from an audience member. And um, it's quite current. It says, do you all feel that the successful election of George Santos uh, reflects a failure of the media? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, we say, we say yes, but the... And I'm not going to remember the name of the local newspaper. Yeah. 
I think it may be a weekly, if I'm well, remembering it's correctly. North Shore Gazette or something. Say it, yeah. I think it's a North Shore Gazette. They, yeah. they did tell this story, right? They wanted to, the editorial board wanted to recommend to um, endorse a Republican. And because they had reported on uh, Mr. Santos, decided that they could not and wrote this. And, you know, there is now a gap. But I'm sure that we've talked a little bit about news deserts here, and it was a, a few minutes late. But that story didn't translate, right? It didn't get picked up um, more broadly. So it, I don't know. I think it is a, a sort of mixed conversation there, right? Like the story didn't get mixed. There were missed. There were journalists who were doing their job. It just wasn't heard by some of the larger media organizations. Can I interrupt there and say, I, I will, in full transparency, the person who asked the question actually did point out that the local, oh, the local newspaper mm -hmm. covered it, mm -hmm. but why didn't anybody else uh, with something like this? Why do you think, well, I think it wasn't picked up? There's, there's a weird parallel here with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And in that they were both local New York elections where the incumbent was expected to win. And newsrooms, which have scarce resources, the New York Daily News, which was for years the paper that, you know, the people who made the city run all, all read. The newsroom has just shrunk to almost nothing. I mean, there, there's people there and they're still doing a very good job, but they're one-tenth the size they once were. The Post is much smaller than it once was. And even the New York Times doesn't have the same metro resources it once had. And so, when they're making decisions of which races to cover, these races where there doesn't seem to be a contest don't get covered. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem. I think there's enough blame to go around. I think the Democratic Party not figuring out that this guy <laughs> was not who he said he was doesn't excuse the media for not figuring that out, but you have to wonder what's going on there. That's their job as well, and, and they didn't. So I think there's, there's plenty of blame to go around, but it's the, it's the scarcity of resources to cover you know, somebody once said to me, you know, Chicago's no more corrupt than any other city. It just has two competitive newspapers, and so they find this <laughs> stuff. And, and I think that that's part of what went on. People didn't expect this to be a story, so they didn't look for it there. And perhaps that goes back to the question of a diverse newsroom. And had you had more locals, more people who lived in other parts of the city than where some of these reporters lived, it's entirely possible someone would have picked up on that that they didn't pick up on um, initially. But this is happening all the time, just in different formats. I mean, where, where I live in Cincinnati, uh, we've had three city council people uh, arrested for corruption, uh, all caught by, I believe, the FBI. And I, I mean, apparently a well-known secret uh, that this sort of thing is underway at the time when this happened. And when I, you know, when I talk to our teams, I, I talk about that as, in some ways, a failure of the local journalism in that market, where, where we also own a TV station and have a, a very accomplished and high-quality investigative team. But you know, the newspaper, the radio stations, the TV stations, nobody blew the whistle on this, even though everybody sort of, I guess, knew this was going on. I mean, I, you know, I don't think the public knew, but the, there were certainly enough sources that knew that the FBI was able to sort of go in and, and, and break it open. That's, that's something we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, we have just a few minutes left, and I'd, I'd love to close with this question so we could practice maybe smart brevity in the answer, and we'll hear what you, what you all have to say about this. So um, since uh, trust is the theme for this year's uh, News Literacy Week, I'd like to know what is the biggest obstacle that your newsrooms face in trying to earn the trust of that portion of the population that just doesn't trust the media. What are you doing, and has it been successful? Yeah. I'll start. I mean, I, th I think America is so polarized at this point um, that in some cases, something that is written in plain English will be interpreted in one way by one group and in another way by another group. Um, we fielded some research recently where we sat down with people uh, trying to identify the, the difference between people's views on the media in, in an urban environment and in a suburban and then rural. 
and, and we're trying to use some of the takeaways from that research to help guide the way we communicate with the various constituencies or stakeholders because we have an obligation to serve them all, not just the ones that are, are, are fans of ours. And so we, we are attempting to try and rebuild that trust with them, not by um, changing our coverage or pandering, but by trying to tackle some of these things we've talked about today with respect to authenticity and transparency. Um, I think for us it comes down to how difficult things are for us in this polarized country. Absolutely. I mean, we're experiencing the same thing. I think, you know, our newsroom is committed to not giving up on those that part of the audience, those readers, um, to continuing to hold power to account, to provide, and we're building up, I think, in the area of empowering people, so giving people the information that they need to make decisions in their lives. You know, we call it service journalism. It's something um, that newsrooms have always done, but we find that when we're doing something like creating you know, a user-friendly database that you can put your address or zip code in and see exactly where you're supposed to go vote. That's something that people use no matter what side of the line they're standing on. And I think we can, you know, use those kinds of tools, that kind of journalism that people are hungry for to help drive them into other parts of our coverage too. So I think it is just to continue to do what we do. Um, our Previous, our former executive editor, Marty Barron, said, we're not at war, we're at work. And that you know, quote, we have a lot of quotes up in our newsroom. That <laughs> quote is now up in our newsroom. And I think you, with, that is something that we hold fast to. We're just, our job is to do our job and to present that fact-based journalism. And no matter who is in power, to make sure that we are holding them to account. Um, and I, I think that is, at its you know simplest form, how we've approached the issue. Um, I have, I mean, I have. I'll share just one quick concern and one hopeful thing. So, in smart brevity, um, <laughs> so the concern I have is that you know that the media ecosystems are so divided by things we can't control. That my big concern is that it's hard to penetrate it. You know, even if we put our heads down and do our best work, we don't control the ultimate full dissemination of our stories um, because people are reading it on you know, social media, they're choosing which social media, they're choosing their channels, um, and they may have already locked in and not open to others. Uh, so that concerns me. Um, that's something that we just have to do our best work and try to get our stories out there um, as best we can and be in all the places, like Chris has said. So that's something that we don't control that I worry about. The thing I am hopeful about, though, is that Axios, we talked about news deserts, Axios has invested big time in local news, and so we're trying to fill that gap. We're in 26 cities now, um, adding a lot more, uh, but our goal is to reconnect and re-engage local audiences with the news that they crave, that they trust. We know that's where the trust gap mm -hmm. is, and um, I do think that uh, we're a newsletter-based platform, and you know, with a newsletter, you're getting that connection to the journalist directly, like from a person to a person, here's what I'm reporting for you today. So that is one way that I am hopeful. And in uh, several of our uh, uh, cities that we started first with, we actually have more subscribers to the newsletter than the local papers have subscribers to their uh, newspapers. Um, now, very different business model, very different product, but the audience, to me, is hopeful. It's a hopeful sign that the audience is there. They're hungry. They do want news. They are missing something, and we can tap into that. And I, and I think that that requires not just a new format, but a new business altogether that can be sustainable. So that's a big part of our mission of restoring trust. Um, I've never been accused of being either smart or brief, but I will try. Um, one of the downsides, I think, one of the things we've lost is this perceived technological advantage we once had. 20 years ago, if Sarah and I had a cause, we could stand on the corner outside of a metro station and hand out mimeograph sheets and say, this is, you know, it's really important you know that the government's doing such and such. And then the Washington Post would come out and people would say, well, this is serious news. These people in the Washington Post are clearly telling the truth. Those maniacs on the corner with the mimeograph sheet, they're not very serious. Now, anybody can produce professional-looking content, 
print or video or, or audio podcast. And so we've lost that edge that people don't necessarily take us more seriously than the people who are out there with a political point than they used to because we had the technological edge over them. The upside, I hope, I think all of us got into this business, and it sounds very hokey, because I do believe that the truth is important and the truth in the long run will win out. And I think that it's simply a matter of keeping these values that we have, maintaining them. It's why I say to people, standards are more important now that we don't have the technological edge that we had before, that we need to show people that we're serious, we can be trusted, and we will own up to our mistakes, which gets us back to the theme tonight. And that's, in the long run, our only hope, because if not, we're, we're just lost in the, in the sort of din. Great. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time, so I want to thank our panelists um, for this evening, and I want to thank all of you for coming as well. Have a, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.